the automated podcast. Welcome again to Automated, the weekly podcast that explores the technologies and their impacts on the future of jobs. My name is Mark Verbenkov. So today I wanted to look at artificial intelligence, specifically because it appears to have the largest impact on jobs from any technology out there. And this is why I chose it to be the first in the series of technologies that will be looked at in the podcast. So we'll look at a number of different aspects of AI. Of course, uh, how it came about, uh, what exactly it is, how advanced it is, who's building it, and then, of course, look at both the present and the future impacts as it relates to jobs. But first of all, maybe we should briefly look at the history of AI. So though there are a number of founding fathers for this technology. It was uh, John McCarthy in 1955 that actually coined the term artificial intelligence and shortly thereafter in the summer of 1956 organized a famous uh, Dartmouth conference where artificial intelligence was founded as an academic discipline. And in the years since there have been a number of waves of both optimism and pessimism for artificial intelligence which either followed a increase or decrease in funding as well as interest in the research for it. So these periods of pessimism are actually termed AI winters and these mostly occurred in the 1970s as well as late 80s and early 90s. However, we are by many accounts currently in a period of great optimism where technological advancement as well as large amounts of funding are going towards the improvement of artificial intelligence. But who's actually building this nowadays? So there are really two leaders now, and those are USA and China. Although artificial intelligence, uh, both the term as well as much of the research started in the United States, it seems to be shifting more towards China right now. So as of 2018, China had a little bit over 1,000 AI companies um, which accounted for about 20% of the world's total. However, the United States still had over 2,000. Though there are many companies scattered across the world, these are the two big players right now, as I mentioned before. So China has actually had a very ambitious policy paper, which really aims at supporting Chinese artificial intelligence development to make it one, if not the world leader in AI development and research by 2030. And this might actually happen. So in 2018, there was a study that came out that analyzed over 2 million of the published AI research papers. And it showed that China is poised to overtake the United States in the most cited 50% of papers back in 2018, in the most cited 10% of papers in 2019, and estimated in the 1% of most cited papers by 2025. So even though AI might not mainly speak English in the future, what exactly is it? So if you've paid attention to any talk of artificial intelligence recently, you've probably come across the terms of machine learning and deep learning being connected to artificial intelligence. So all these terms are connected. Uh, However, uh, they are nested within each other. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which is an umbrella term for any computer program that does something smart. So artificial intelligence has many different definitions depending on who you're talking to. However, overall, you can say that it is a computer system able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. And some examples of this include uh, visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, and translation between languages. Whereas machine learning is dynamic and does not really require human intervention to make certain changes. So in a sense, machine learning programs adjust themselves in response to the data that they're exposed to, pretty much like how a child is born not really knowing anything, and they adjust uh, their understanding of the world in response to certain stimuli as well as experiences. So machine learning programs, they constantly optimize themselves through repetition and many, 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 many failures. Deep learning, on the other hand, is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, which is extremely similar to machine learning. 
However, you can also add that it tends to result in higher accuracy, require much more hardware or training time, as well as data, and perform exceptionally well on machine perception tasks that involve a number of different uh, data, such as uh, pixels or texts or blobs of images. So the ultimate goal in many of the artificial intelligence circles is actually something called AGI or artificial general intelligence. And this is the intelligence of a machine that has the capacity to understand or learn any intellectual task that a human being can do. So therefore we have a few categories of AI that we can look over. So narrow or weak AI, which is what we currently have today. Um, it's where the artificial intelligence focuses on one specific task, right? And then the second category, which is the artificial general intelligence. Um, this is also considered as strong AI, though strong can also be used to describe uh, a state of being self-aware. And this is really the capacity to do anything that a human can do, as I mentioned before. So I know that this is a rather simplified uh, perspective of what AI is. And for those of you that are more interested in a further breakdown, uh, there are tons of really interesting books as well as podcasts out there. Uh, you can take a look at the show notes where I'll have a list of some of them. Um, I personally really like to listen to Lex Friedman on the Artificial Intelligence podcast, as well as uh, This Week in Machine Learning and AI. But again, I'll have the list of uh, some interesting books, as well as links to these uh, two interesting podcasts in the show notes. So sorry for making it so simple, but it could be really easy to spend an entire 30 minutes uh, pelting everybody with uh, some of the finer specifics of how AI actually is. But uh, that's kind of out of the scope of this podcast. But what does this mean in practice? You know, what, what can artificial intelligence actually do? And I think the best way to show the current capabilities of artificial intelligence is perhaps to run through some of the more well-known instances where AI actually beat human beings at certain tasks. So Arthur Samuel was one of the pioneers of machine learning. And back in 1962, he actually taught a, a computer program to play checkers, and it actually beat the checkers champion of Connecticut. However, we can look at a much more famous example where in 1996, Gary Kasparov, who was the reigning global chess champion, defeated Deep Blue, IBM's supercomputer, in a six-match set. However, after undergoing significant upgrades, Deep Blue beat Gary in their next set, which only happened a year later in 1997. Though this was and still is perhaps the most publicized event of man versus AI, many today don't even consider Deep Blue to be a genuine AI, as this was an example of uh, what's referred to as good old-fashioned AI. And this is really simply where rules are explicitly programmed by a human hand and predefined for a specific purpose, and then use the computational power to just brute force uh, whatever is trying to be solved or, or figured out. This is really uh, opposed to the deep learning techniques, which would come about a decade later. However, Deep Blue was able to calculate these uh, simple rules at a tremendous, or one could say, even a superhuman rate, thus defeating uh, Gary Kasparov. Another similar example of this, uh, which maybe some of you have heard of, is uh, Watson, who defeated the uh, Jeopardy! champions. So this took place in 2011, where IBM's uh, Watson competed on Jeopardy! against uh, two legendary champions, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings, and actually won the first prize of a million dollars. However, this was still considered the good old-fashioned uh, artificial intelligence. So in 2016... Google DeepMind's organization created AlphaGo. And this program was to beat the 18-time world champion of Go, Lee Sedol. And then in 2017, the AlphaGo successor, AlphaGo Master, beat the then reigning world champion, KJ. So Go is actually really important because it cannot be beaten through brute force calculations, much like chess or Jeopardy. And this is because there are more potential valid moves than there are atoms in the universe. And for this reason, Go has often been seen as a game that uses intuition rather than straight logic. 
and Go Masters often describe the great moves that they perform in a match as feeling right. So AlphaGo used a number of different methods to first mimic professional human players, then learn new strategies for itself. And it actually ended up studying Go match databases, essentially studying to the extent that someone with 80 years of experience would have. So to give some scope of the exponential or explosive power of deep reinforcement learning, AlphaGo Zero, which was the next iteration, in 2017, with only three days of playing against only itself. This means that no data on human matches was actually used. The AlphaGo Zero beat the original AlphaGo 100 to zero. And then in December of 2017, Alpha Zero, the newest iteration, only needed 24 hours to beat the three day AlphaGo Zero version. So there are also examples of professional video game players in popular games such as uh, StarCraft or Dota 2 being absolutely demolished by artificial intelligence. So some of these are the OpenAI 5 against the Dota 2 players and the DeepMind's Alpha Star against StarCraft players. And these players are again at champion level in both cases and they were absolutely destroyed. I think it was 10 to 1 um, in the case of Alpha Star. So apart from games, there are actually many different examples of other applications that are already being in used or at least being put into pilots. One of these is called Wobot and it is an AI chatbot using uh, something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps with depression. And it actually sends over a million messages a week to support users with anxiety, depression, loneliness, addiction, as well as many other problems. Another classic example of AI applications has to do with uh, radiologists. There's actually a system that has already been proven to be 50% better at classifying malignant tumors than uh, expert human radiologists. So this company actually has another system which can examine x-rays to detect wrist fractures and it also outperforms human experts. However, perhaps the most well-known use of artificial intelligence is in vehicles, enabling them to be partially autonomous today. However, all of these examples are just examples of narrow artificial intelligence that can only focus on a single or at best a few problems. But it should be apparent that though these examples are at the beginning of their capabilities, if we are to use the AlphaGo example as any sort of measure, AI can improve very, very quickly. So it is most probable that within a few years, these examples could be much further advanced if sufficient funding and work is actually done, of course. So we can now shift gears a little bit and look at artificial intelligence and how it actually benefits employment. And by doing so, we can see that the artificial intelligence industry as of 2018 was worth about 1.2 trillion dollars and is actually estimated to reach up to about 4 trillion by 2022. And with the growth of this industry, uh, many jobs have actually been generated because of it, focusing on both the building and improving of the technology, but also looking at business cases and applications for its use. And this will continue uh, as the industry itself grows. However, current narrow AI also augments people's capabilities in something that has been termed centaur teams, where both humans as well as AI work together to improve the quality of work that's done. So this was originally used for chess players using their computer to augment their strategies and beating other human players or less capable AI uh, chess playing programs. So today these uh, augmented centaur teams are actually used in a number of specific tasks already. The radiology example that was used before actually enables radiologists to focus on other aspects of their job and leaves the more tedious work to the AI. So even IBM's Watson was implemented in lung cancer treatment in New York, where staff has used Watson's guidance when dealing with patient diagnosis as well as treatment plans. And as far back as 2013, something like 90% of nurses were already following Watson's guidance. So the final example that we can look at here is uh, on autonomous driving. So at lower levels of autonomous driving, 
uh, parallel parking can actually be done by AI systems today, which I think for any novice driver is really seen as an absolute blessing. I, for one, had to delay my uh, first driving test because I had problems with parallel parking and would definitely have preferred to have an AI do this. So this has really been the more positive perspective on artificial intelligence's impact on jobs. However, we can also shift gears and look at the more pessimistic or potentially negative perspective of its impact. So on the other hand, there is another specific perspective that looks at AI's future. And this is actually one of the main reasons that I wanted to look at AI as the first technology in the podcast. And this specific perspective looks at artificial general intelligence and says that once it comes out, it's entirely possible that human creativity, ingenuity, and capacity for reason will be made completely inferior, much like our chess skills of the 90s. So though there are still competitions and new world champions nowadays, they are still absolutely no match for their digital counterparts. So artificial general intelligence, AGI, is also seen as bringing about a potential new revolution of innovation that is really difficult to fathom, especially if it will be able to modify its underlying programming and make constant modifications as well as upgrades to itself without any human interference. So I mentioned before that new projects leverage current technologies, which augment various capacities of individuals. The example that I used before was uh, this podcast, or any podcast for that matter, and that all that was really needed to produce something like this was a computer. However, by leveraging AGI in the future, it would be entirely possible to have all the research done, all the editing, all the writing, and even publishing and sharing of the podcast itself. So all I would be needed for is actually speaking, though with a decent speech program, I wouldn't even be needed for this either. So the same could be done for numerous professions, as any mental or cognitive activity needed to improve a technology or project could theoretically be done faster and with more precision and quality by a artificial intelligence. So if taken to its logical conclusion, we would be hard pressed to think of a place where humans would actually be relevant or needed for any employment purposes at all. And if you're thinking that AI could never create music or beautiful paintings or art in general, please check out the show notes where there are links to early AI music, such as Ava AI, which I've actually been listening to while preparing this entire episode, as well as art created by artificial intelligence. Though it may not currently please everyone, the point is that even with the very narrow and quite young and immature AI programs today, this is already currently possible. So really for this reason, many have stated that AGI could really be the last invention that humans would ever need to create. So some even go so far as to say that all of humanity, even our entire purpose, might simply be reduced to spawning this new form of life. Much like many people believe that the first single-celled life form's purpose was to bring about us. So though this is certainly a point of view that many take today, it's really not possible to clearly guess how the more distant future will turn out. So maybe in the meantime, let's turn the conversation back to the current ideas on the impact of jobs. And to start doing so, we can look at a classic 2013 Oxford study, uh, which is called the Future of Employment, which has been widely used to explain which jobs are at risk of overall automation and which ones aren't. So very basically, low risk of automation jobs require creative knowledge as well as innovation. And these include many domains such as education, media, as well as healthcare. Whereas jobs that are at a high risk of automation are really predictable and routine. And some of these include uh, accountants, uh, junior lawyers, as well as telemarketers. So this is really supported and has been added to with a new study by IBM that came out only a few days ago, where IBM claims that as many as 120 million workers in the world's 12 largest economies may need to be retrained or reskilled as a result of AI and intelligent automation. So the study actually includes input from over 5,000 executives in almost 50 countries and explains how a fundamental shift in how companies really start to manage and think about the changing workforce needs is really required. 
So one of the interesting insights from this study is that the time it takes to close a skills gap through training has actually increased by more than 10 times in just the last four years. So in 2014, it took three days on average to close a capability gap through training in a average enterprise. However, in 2018, this now took 36 days. The study really shows that new skill requirements are rapidly emerging while other skills are becoming absolutely obsolete. So to showcase this, back in 2016, executives in many of these different organizations actually ranked the technical core capabilities for STEM, such as the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as uh, basic computer and software application skills as really the top uh, critical skills needed for employees. However, in 2018, the top skills that were sought after were actually behavioral skills. So some of these included uh, willingness to be flexible, agile, as well as adaptable to change, uh, time management skills, and the ability to prioritize. Therefore, it's really easy to see that as narrow or weak AI becomes more and more advanced and utilized by organizations across the world, the impact on our employment and jobs in general accelerates as well. However, if artificial general intelligence with a number of other technologies do actually bring about technological unemployment on a massive scale, as more and more people are actually advocating, then large scale social and economic shifts are really inevitable. And further discussions about this, I think are absolutely necessary. So though artificial intelligence is perhaps the main technology to cause an eventual shift of this magnitude, many other technologies are also potentially contributing, which we will look at in the preceding episodes. So thanks for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed this short look at artificial intelligence and its impact on jobs. So as many of you might know, the artificial intelligence on many of these different podcasting platforms actually do distribute the podcast to more people based on the number of subscriptions, ratings, and reviews that are actually given. So if you want to help out and support the podcast, feel free to do so wherever you listen to podcasts. So thanks again. And for next week, we'll be looking at robots and their impact on jobs. The Automated Podcast.